Dr. Lauren Hester. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. Thank you, President Caruso. But you know, I really, he's my friend David. And I want to uh, give thanks and uh, great respect to all of you who have played a part in what culminates in this remarkable day. To parents and families, to the boards of trustees and governors, the chancellor, faculty, and staff, Taking the time and devoting the resources to the kind of action-oriented education here at Antioch University, New England, is no small feat in this day and age. And I really commend you for all of the work and focus it's taken to get to this point. And, and I know firsthand uh, some of the um, <coughs> impact that the education here can have. In fact, Fair Food Network employs one of your graduates. So Joel Moyer, who graduated from here not long ago, is one of our uh, uh, key folks in one of our projects here in New England. Well, this morning I want to share some thoughts with you on what it means to invest. So when I, when I say that word invest, kind of get a mind's eye of what comes to mind. You know, investments and return on investments. You know, when I first started thinking about that, uh, th this topic, I thought about this, the 1967 motion picture, The Graduate, right, with the young Dustin Hoffman. Now, in those days, remember when he graduates, the one word wasn't investments, it was plastics. But, uh, you know, in today's world, in many places, the, the word that you might hear when you graduate is investments. Pay attention to investments. And you know, I've spent a lot of time in the world of philanthropy and endowments where in investments are king. I mean, you only do your work at a foundation because of the funds, the return on the investments that are made from the money that's invested. And uh, I, I know my friend David is thinking about this, and as I get a little older and grayer, I am too, you know? How are our investments doing in our IRAs, our 401ks, our 403bs? So all those kinds of investments come to mind. But when I go a little deeper, and I think about the most important investments that I've made in my life, it's really not about money and financial returns. The most important investments, and the ones that have paid the most handsome returns, are those investments of time, of passion, of intellect, and of focused energy. Really, investments that have helped me follow my life's passion and purpose. Now, David told you when we first met, uh, I was actually an organic farmer, about 20 years old in uh, Santa Cruz. And the day that David met me, what he didn't say is that the first thing he saw was my backside and my legs because my head and most of my torso was down in a hole trapping gophers to protect our organic vegetables. Um, you know, so, you know, uh, a kid growing up in Berkeley, ending up spending time early in, in a career in organic farming is not something that you're likely to see back in the early 70s. These days, it's much more likely. Back then, it wasn't. So I want to uh, tell you a story about um, a few years ago when I was having a dinner with my rabbi's father, Sander Fine, and another gentleman whose name is Jim Kunkana. And the reason that I bring these names up, and I would say blessed, uh, blessed be their names in memory, is because that was the last time I ever had a conversation with these two gentlemen. It was in the evening at the start of a, a, re a weekend retreat. Um, because within the year after that conversation, both of these men passed away. Uh, so, uh, my rabbi's father and Jim Kunkenen, who is a Native American man, and we're all together at a Jewish renewal retreat in northern Michigan for the weekend. And Sander says to me, Oren, you have to tell Jim the story about how, how you really uh, found yourself on that farm and what you did there. So I was telling uh, Jim the story. I was telling him about the story, how, you know, I had come to UC Santa Cruz um, in those days. Um, 
you know, early in, in the 1970s to start my education. To tell you the truth, I was not really that interested in my undergraduate education in the classroom. I was really interested in uh, learning through experience. And that brought me right to what only later I learned was the very first student organic farm that was ever created in the United States. You find them all over now, but in the early 70s, 1970s, Santa Cruz was the first spot. And I just got drawn to that place and um, started learning how to grow organic vegetables and fruit. Before there was an organic label, before organic food became that popular. Um, but I, I just knew that this was something that I loved doing and I actually ended up uh, erecting a teepee and living in a teepee on that property for two years and working every day from, you know, sometimes before dawn till after dusk many times in my bare feet working in that garden and learning how to grow food and feeding ourselves. There were 20 of us. It was actually a hippie commune living on, uh, on uh, university property is what it was. <laughs> Uh, but there, uh, I realized uh, during that time there were a couple of very important learnings that came to me. One was that I knew back then that the way we were trying to feed ourselves collectively on this planet was not going to sustain us for the future. We could not keep the, the sort of large global chemicalized food system in operation for very much longer. And the other thing I learned is that there are other ways to grow our food. And we knew that because we were actually doing it. In fact, we were so committed to this experiment in Santa Cruz that we did, we were completely off the energy grid and we did not even have a single internal combustion engine on the property. All of our work was done either by hand or with animal power. We collected, you know, uh, organic uh, trash from all, uh, organic garbage from all of the dining halls around campus and that's what we made our compost piles with uh, to fertilize our plants. And uh, it was during that time that I, I became aware of what my life's purpose was going to be. And what I, what I said to Jim that night and Sandra was, I, it was as if the earth spoke to me directly through my body and said to me that my, life was going, my life's purpose was about helping us figure out how we are going to feed ourselves in a way that was going to sustain our, our environment and bring harmony to our communities for the future. I knew that. I didn't know how I was going to do it. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I realized that was my purpose. So at that moment, uh, Jim interrupted me in the conversation, and he says, what else were you doing at that time? I said, you know, I was farming all day long. I mean, that was our work. He said, no, think back. There must have been something else. And I said, well, um, I had been introduced to Zazen meditation by my friend David and my girlfriend at that time. And so every morning before we started working in the garden, I would sit in meditation in my teepee, and Jim says, that explains it. I said, explains what? He says, you know, in our Native American tradition, what you're describing, we would call a vision quest. You were very fortunate because it rarely happens to men as young as you were. And he says, I think what happened was you quieted your mind just enough through the meditation to be able to hear the messages that the earth had for you. And that was a time when, uh, you know, we were, we were planting uh, fruit trees, we were uh, planting and bartering vegetables, but it was really the investment of, of attention and intention that I put in that work for those two years that handed me my life's purpose, a return that has paid off handsomely many times. After that, and I left the farm and, and uh, had the sprout business for a while, but then decided that there was another investment that I had to make for my life if I was truly going to follow my purpose, and that was an, ed, an ed, uh, investment in education. And my investment in education handed me the tools to put my passion and purpose to work, taking action. Now, I don't know much about traditional investment stocks and bonds and hedge funds, but I, I learned something about what it takes to invest in building a social movement, a movement for social change in the food system. And as David said, I had a real opportunity to learn about that by practicing at Kellogg Foundation for over 15 years, investing the foundation's money in, not in uh, stocks and bonds, but in people, ideas, and projects on the ground. That early investment that I made in uh, learning what my life's purpose was, 
really helped me develop an internal compass that has helped me many times in my life, many times since. The ability to stay centered on my purpose, even as huge winds of change came with the potential to knock me off course. And I'm going to share one of those stories with you right now. So I was at Kellogg Foundation back in 2007, and things were going great. I mean, the board had just approved the next six years of our program and over $50 million to spend on our sustainable ag work, and things were going great. When a very wealthy couple that had ties to Ann Arbor came to me and said, we are going to start a brand new grant-making foundation. The sole purpose of this foundation is going to be uh, equity and sustainability in the food system. We would like you to leave Kellogg Foundation and come start this new foundation and run it for us. Well, this is like every program director's dream in a foundation, right? Some people who had lots of money who want you to come and uh, tell them how it should be spent and actually you know, create the structure to do that. And this was going to be a program that was larger than the Kellogg program. And I thought, my God, this is, this is going to bring new resources to a field that really needs it. So, in 2000, uh, beginning of 2008, I left Kellogg Foundation and started the Fair Food Foundation with these folks and spent the year in 2008 hiring six staff and building out office space in Ann Arbor and putting all the systems together that you need to be a major grant-making foundation. All the computer systems, we worked with, with our small board, which included the donors on vision, mission, value, strategies, and we're sitting here in December of 2008 considering our first docket of grants. We had some great projects that had come in, and we were thinking, what are we going to fund? And on a day I remember really well, because it was actually my birthday, December 11th, I get a phone call from the donors in the evening. And they say, Warren, we just heard something on the news that we need you to hear from us before you hear it anywhere else. I say, what's going on? And they say, Bernie's been arrested. I say, Bernie who? <laughs> they say, Bernie Madoff. I say, who is that? Well, he's the person we have all of our money invested with. And he was just arrested for securities fraud. Well, uh, you know, by uh, when I woke up the, that next morning, uh, I knew this project had evaporated. I mean, you know, the money was gone. So um, uh, after uh, sort of uh, trying to orient myself about what had just happened, um, I, I really uh, found myself right back, actually within a few days, right back standing on the, in the garden at Santa Cruz in my bare feet, internally. And I realized there's only one important question here, and that is, what am I being asked to do next? Right? What is the universe asking of me next? And, uh, I'm very fortunate that I have a very supportive wife and children and uh, my mother was alive at that time and my sisters and my good friends like David who I really rallied around me to, su to support this situation where I had basically lost a job, I had to terminate everybody I had hired and put them into the worst economy we'd ever seen in the Detroit area. It was a crazy time. Um, but when I asked myself that important question, that had been given to me because investments that I had made very early in my life, I realized that what was being asked of me was to continue my leadership in this field. And so in January of 2009, I started writing the book Fair Food and I organized the Fair Food Network, a nonprofit organization to continue the work that we had started with the foundation. I figured, well, the, the need is still here. The ideas are still here. My leadership hasn't gone away. I just need the money. So we went about starting to raise the money, and I would say, I, I just want to uh, say, let you know how blessed I feel that in the last four years we've been able to build a really thriving organization with over 15 employees and offices in Ann Arbor and Detroit and Boston and Washington, D.C., and doing great public policy work on the Farm Bill and great work in our communities in Detroit and other places. But the point of the story is it, it emphasizes how important it is for us to invest our time and attention to understanding and cultivating our intention. That we spend time and attention cultivating intention about what our purpose is and what we are here really to do. And with the tools that you're being given now and you have been given with your education. 
So it's important for each of us to invest carefully. But think not about just the investments that you make or that I make in time and passion and energy, but also the investments that others make in you. You have each made a significant investment and sacrifice to complete your education. There's no doubt about that. But here at Antioch University of New England, you're not the only ones who have invested in this accomplishment. Uh, your families, I'm sure, have all invested in many ways in you for many years. Your teachers and professors, the boards of governors and trustees here, the broader community that supports one of the most excellent higher education systems in the world. These are all investments that now have been made in you. And many of us, including me, who now now invest our hope and promise of creating a more sustainable future in you. Now, uh, this just became much more personal to me about a month ago when I learned that my eldest daughter is now pregnant with our first grandchild. <laughs> and I'm going to be a grandpa in the fall. So, the, you know, I used to talk about the need to project, to protect the earth for future generations. That's not just a concept to me anymore, folks, right? But the, the need to create a more just, equitable, equitable, and peaceful society has just taken on new meaning for me, and I'm counting on each of you to play your part. So as you think about the investments you have made and those investments that others have made in you, the returns aren't going to be calculated so much in the price of a home or how fancy a car you drive or how big your paycheck is. The ROI that really matters most and that each of us is responsible for now are the returns on investment that educate our children, that, that cools our planet, that preserves biodiversity, that provides food security, that creates a new vision for health that cares for the most vulnerable among us, and that continues to nurture democracy. Those are the returns we need most seriously in our society. So I'm just gonna end with another uh, little story. It was just uh, last week, in fact, last Friday, I got a call from, uh, from a, uh, he's an investor. What can I say? If you ask, you know, I'm not gonna tell you his name, but if somebody asks you, do you know this fella? They're gonna say, yeah, he's an investor. He, he's, you know, he, he inherited money as a young man and he spent his life investing in businesses very successfully. And we were having a chat about the, uh, a new investment fund that Fair Food Network is building called the Fair Food Fund to invest in businesses that are helping uh, small and mid-scale sustainable farmers connect with the growing demand for their products locally. But he, so he called me to, to talk about that. And, but before we started talking about that, I, I, he said, how you doing? I said, you know, I just spent the best morning, I just spent the morning uh, pruning my fruit trees. And he says, really? I said, yeah, I mean, it's like fabulous. You know, last year in Michigan, we lost 90% of our fruit crop because we had this crazy early spring and then late frost, but things are looking good now and the trees were just amazing last week, blooming. And he said, well, how, how long does it take to get fruit off that tree? off those trees. And I said, uh, you know, about five years, four or five years, but this is year six and it's really going to be quite a harvest. And he says, boy, so you're, uh, you, uh, who planted the trees? I said, I did. He said, you planted those trees six years ago and you're waiting this long to harvest that fruit. And I said, absolutely. And uh, it's the kind of investment that I guess I've been making all my life. And it reminded me of an early Sunday morning last August. So last August, we had the 40th year reunion of uh, uh, those members of our hippie commune on university property. <laughs> We're all dispersed over many areas, but most of us came back for a weekend and we did it at the farm. So we were there, about 25 of us, at the farm in Santa Cruz spending a weekend. And uh, it was on the Sunday morning of that August weekend that I found myself sitting underneath one of the heirloom apple trees that I had planted 40 years earlier and it was full of fruit and I want to tell you the taste of that apple was the sweetest return on investment that I've ever tasted so I 
like to end, my hope and blessing for each of you is that you understand the importance of the investments that you have made here in yourself at AUNE, and that you find as sweet a return on these investments as I found in that heirloom apple. Congratulations.